Um, I'd like to thank um, Elizabeth and, and uh, everyone here at LA Louver. I would uh, especially like to thank um, Enrique for the invitation to share the stage with you. And I think one more note of thanks for this truly, uh, I, th I think, impressive and incredible and deep and rich and thoughtful um, first show back uh, in Los Angeles after you've moved back here with your family and returned your studio to the West Coast. Um, it's a, it's a, a very humbling um, uh, opportunity to, to be here with you, so I thank you for that. Um, we, uh, I think we'll have a, a, a very, we haven't prepared for this. We're like kids caught out of school without notes, although I was here all afternoon studying. Um, I don't know where Enrique was. Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 I, and I hope this will be a little bit less of, of just a Q&A and, and a conversation because I hope to hear um, a lot from Enrique about this work in particular and give him a chance to sort of reflect, reflect back on it. Um, one of the if you if you haven't had a chance to when you're when when we are done here you should go into the back room um, where there is an installation of uh, a sculpture standing in the middle of a of a pool of water a, a young boy that, that is dripping tears um, and I'd like to um, uh, ask Enrique to to talk about the 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 sort of happy accident of that installation, which more than on more than one occasion he has he has suggested is kind of the a kind of central engine or a central uh, uh, piece of of this entire exhibition and this entire body of work. Thank you for being here. Um, can you hear me? Um, so, what Jonathan is referring to is the barrier where the where the tears connect, contact the, the seeds, in that place, grass had begun to grow. Um, they, we had done some tests at the studio, um, but it didn't quite work. The, uh, but here at the gallery, it has worked very nicely. And what happens is, um, the, the idea of grass growing from this, from this collision of tears and the barrier that holds those tears back. Um, in many ways, although it was not really planned, it's hard to imagine a better outcome of this installation than that. Um, the idea of this regrowth, many ways this, this exhibition speaks of, or speaks of, but touches on loss and redemption and how those things come about in both the domestic and the epic spheres. So to have in that installation that occurrence where the very, the very tears that the boy is shedding um, allow for a new growth to come out of those seeds, which of course when you go upstairs you see what those seeds are about. They're about those birds. Um, so, so that regrowth, as simple as it is and as a happenstance that he has turned out to be, is perhaps as telling as anything else in this exhibition, um, which is a strange thing because I cannot really take credit for it. Um, so, um, but, but, but that in a more serious note, most many things that occur in this body of work and in all of my paintings depends on things that I cannot always take credit for. So it's not completely an extraordinary event. Right, and I think that this, this particularly with regard to, to your paintings, but really with regard to the, to the sort of a question or a problem for painting in general is this, this the question of the accidental, right? And the, and the level of control that you're able to bring to the work or to relinquish. And I think that, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that I get out of the work and I think that, that you know, others will see in the work that, you know, it's it, it sort of in today, in the contemporary art environment today, you know, the work is in some sense, you know, working against the grain of a kind of dominant strain of just a kind of loose, you know, abstraction or something like this. Um, and yet there is such a, there is such a, 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 you know, and so there's such intentionality in this, in the work, right? There's such a desire to, to communicate, to get something across 
and yet a willingness to to sort of entertain a certain amount of this of of the accidental and i can't i can never help thinking that you know th that's not you know it's not pictorial laziness it's not like oh you know i'll just let, let that let that go that there's that there's a significance of that and i wonder if you could speak a little bit about you know how it is that you court that sense of the accidental in the working process but particularly within in in paintings that are that are you know trying so very hard to kind of grasp a a, a sensibility or an emotion or a thought or a kind of a, a, even just a thought process yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can do some justice um, to, to this question because it's very important and and it's a, it's a complicated question to answer without spending the next hour talking about painting so so I started as an apprentice for a painter painter making very sort of classically oriented paintings. Um, over the process of years of working, I got to a point of crisis where I can no longer work in paintings. I could not find authenticity in painting. And as for those of you who are very involved in the art world, you know that the very notion of authenticity is problematic. Nonetheless, for me, this was very important. Um, and over the years, I began to work in a very different way that I worked before. So these paintings are made with oil and wax, large brushes, usually without sources, and without any predetermined um, sketches other than my own writings. So all the accidents you see of um, the crude way in which they're painted, the translucent layers which they're built, the drips, are both to create a reference and to undermine that reference. My, my sense about painting is that painting is only has the possibility of being authentic when you reveal its contradictions in it. I mean, many of the critique of painting that have been put forth, and many of the people who have painted around that critique have, have in my opinion, oversimplified the problems. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting to me is to lay the problem of painting next to, to an attempt at solving painting. So, so in a painting like this, which took about four years to make, and there are layers and layers and layers, which you can see, uh, the gallery has some images of the history of it. Um, at the end, ends up both as a created image, as an undermined image, as something that is put forward and at the same time denied. Um, you, for a minute, you see this as a scene from where you are. You see a space being created here. And if you get close to it, you realize that a space has been undermined and broken. This is not a, a wink to you or an attempt to make some sort of RC gesture, but rather to try to rescue the, what a painting is intrinsically from the desire of the reference to destroy that painting. Right. Um, and, and to create that balance is, is the reason why I spent the painting four years to make it, because you move a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and the painting is destroyed, even though maybe to most people it would look more or less the same. Um, in fact, very often, people will come to my studio and missed a version of one of these paintings that was underneath, because it was more beautiful or more appealing. But that is never the goal of the work. So, so often, the something more beautiful is sacrificed in, in all these paintings. And you look around the edges, you can see the histories of, of those paintings, um, what they were before. So let me say one more thing about this. So I, what, what Jonathan just asked me is at the center of my thinking about it. So if you are really interested in this, you could go and, and see some of the writings I have done about this, where I maybe sound a little bit more coherent than I'm sounding right now, and, and, and touch on this in a, in a more, um, detail way. I, I mean, I think that what I really appreciate about that description is that it's, there's a, there's a, com there's a complete sense of self-awareness, self-consciousness of the project that's involved 
with a, with a, with the understanding that the thing that has to be defeated is a kind is the irony is the is sort of the easy way out is the is the sort of self reflexivity that becomes just that it's just a reflex, um, and so some sort of standard thinking and so that's the that becomes the 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 pitfall to be avoided, and so I wanted to ask you one thing that actually struck struck me today when I was spending some time looking at this is looking at this work. Um, and I was looking at, at this one with the, with the sort of bright sun. Um, and there are effects that are painted into the work. And I may be wrong about this one, and there's one or two there's in, in this painting on that wall as well. And so forgive me if, if I'm getting this wrong. But there are effects that register the surface of the painting not as a, a canvas, as a material surface the way the drips of the paint do, but the surface of the canvas as like a lens, right? And so you get this kind of lens flare, which you wouldn't get if you were just looking at that with the naked eye, right? You're getting that circular and you're getting this kind of bright lens flare. And then here, forgive me if I get up, there, there are these circles that look like they begin to flare out on the side here, which again, for me, began to read something like a, like a, tran like a the, the transparency registering the, the surface of the canvas. And then in that picture, along the bottom left-hand edge of the, of the base, there are a set of red ovals that repeat going down to the left that are neither you know, part of just the materiality of the paint, but are also not sort of of, of the image. So I may be wrong. Right, I may be completely, you know, reading into this, this, you know, these sort of accidents. But, it, you know, given that there's a, you know, there's a sort of thematic of transparency and opacity that's happening in other works that's sort of written into the content, you know, is, you know, is this something? Is there a kind of, you know, the 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 screen of the canvas or the lens that that the that the image presents something that you know, provide, you know is, is a way of working through this problem of, of the painting as both surface and image, that kind of, that little liminal space. Yeah, I mean, that, that is true, that is, that is correct. And you see transparency throughout this work and upstairs you see fires. Um, there, are, there are things that paintings do not do well, even when Vermeer does it. Um, when you look at, at a gray vermeer of light going through, through a window, falling onto the balance of the woman holding the balance like this, um, I mean, that illusion of light is against the very thing that painting is. If you get, painting is ultimately a bunch of dirt mixed together with some binding, a smear on cotton, in this case. So, but painting can also be this other possibility. And, and both of them, if a painting is gonna be, have some sort of claim of authenticity, it's gonna to have to be both at once. Neither one of them overcoming the other, neither one of them canceling the other. So one of the things I like to bring to the forefront is exactly what you're doing, uh, what you mentioned. The, the, the notion of those things that painting is not good at. So right from the onset, it's a confession of futility, a confession of failure. I'm very interested in works of art that from the onset acknowledge the failure. I'm not so interested in works of art that from a distance advertise their seriousness and then when you get close they're serious. I mean, so uh, I find that to be, to be not interesting enough. Mm. So, so I like to put paintings in a hole from which they have to sort of crawl out against their own sort of uh, nature. Uh, of what a painting is. A painting is distance, is a removal, is a certain way to, to apprehend the world. Um, so, so the aspect of an optical device is very much what painting is not. Um, but it's not an ironic position. Any of you in this room are smart enough to know that the world is not black and white, that there's gray all along the continuum. But but the role of intelligence, in my opinion, is to find, to find some sort of order and moral structure to your life within that great continuity. And that, and that is the position of, of an artist, rather than being ironic and point to everyone. 
which is the role of many artists, right. I think. How, how things are gray, how paintings really are not true, how, um, how any, everything has been done, and how dumb it is to try to render the, the falling, you know, the sun falling, um, that it is a futile and sort of um, church did it better. That would be, a, that would be a, um, an argument from someone. Um, but, but the fact is, knowing that, then what? Knowing that you're working from a whole, then what is possible? Acknowledging the deficit of painting from the onset and say, what can be constructed from a fire, from, from the burning of the field? What can you build up from there? That but, is saying, but saying the church did it better is an argument that it's a failure on the part of the painter, not a failure of painting. Well, but, but churches were failures themselves, just better failures. <laughs> okay. You know, in that, rega <laughs> in, in that regard. I mean, I think, I think um, I mean, many years ago, I saw this monk um, son that he uh, did at the university. Um, and I thought, I was 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I thought, that is just, that is such a bad painting. Why will you try to paint the sun? I mean, it seemed to me that it was, there was no comparison that painting could ever measure against the sun itself. So it was always at a, at a disadvantage. And it took me maybe 15 years after that, or 10 years after that, to realize that was the entire point. <laughs> the, the, I mean, this, this becomes a very sort of fascinating, so there's, there's two strands that, we can, that you can sort of take this. I mean, one, what you were just describing about the sort of painting of the sun, sort of puts me in mind, there's this, there's this great painting by Turner um, called Regulus, which is, you know, Regulus is the Roman general who suffered the fate of having to watch the sunrise with his eyelids cut off. And I know that sounds pretty gruesome, but um, en Enrique has reference to a, a Brothers Grimm uh, fairy tale called the uh, Juniper Tree, which, if you haven't read it, um, this is pretty sick stuff. So, um, you know, I feel like I've got a little license there. Um, but, you know, but so that, you know, that is an attempt to sort of, to, to imagine, you know, in a sense, you know, a, 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 an embodiment of light that is so blinding, right, that one can't turn away. And then there's this famous poem by Kleist um, about a Caspar David Friedrich painting, which he talks about looking at this Caspar David Friedrich painting called Monk by the Sea and saying that it's, you know, that to, to look at it is to, to look at it as if one's eyelids have been cut away. Um, and so, you know, this this sense of not, you know, there, there's, 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 this, this sense of, of, of loss, of, of a lost control, of like the sort of total desire, which then is actually the, the story of the juniper tree um, uh, uh, fairy tale, which you'll, you'll have to tell to the audience because I'm far too delicate to retell it. Um, but then there's, you know, then there's also the sense of like the, the constant desire on the part of artists, of painters, to sort of capture that illumination, right? How to capture that illumination. Um, and I bring up the, you know, I bring up the Caspar David Friedrich as well because, you know, in that sense, you know, he's not an artist whose work was ever, you know, was ever on the, along the lines of Turner trying to capture, the, you know, trying to capture it for real, trying to sort of, you know, grab hold of the light, but is going after that sort of internal illumination. And I, you know, I, it, it, it can't get it out of my mind. I don't look at your work and I don't see Caspar David Friedrich because there's, you know, it doesn't have necessarily the same, although, you know, there is a certain sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, in some of the compositions, a willingness to sort of occupy the center, which I really appreciate because too many people sort of shy away from it. Um, but it's there in the sensibility, right? And, you know, if, for you, I know that you're sort of steeped in, in a world of kind of late 18th, early 19th century sort of the, a, a romantic tradition of, of philosophy and literature. Um, and, you know, I have to ask, how is how has that continued to be a font of 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 activity for you? Why, like, why is how is that the resource, right? Where whereas for so many, for so many people, you sort of look at look at much of that material as being completely, you know, foreign, completely other to the 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 kinds of thinking and the kinds of activities that we that we are concerned with today. Um, how do we tackle this? Um, you know, uh, fun, the, you know, the reason I'm not a romantic painter is because I cannot be. 
I mean, it would be in some ways nice to be one, to have the state of mind, the position in one's life that will allow to be that kind of painter. But that sense of, that sense of struggle of, of, you know, self and the world and so on have been so problematized by our lives, by, by my life, that, that whenever I read any critic um, mentioning my work uh, was through the romantic lens, I find that they haven't read enough philosophy to, to be able to make those kinds of claims. They're trivial claims. They're claims because they will see this, the landscapes and they will see the individual within the landscape and they will immediately put the imprimatur of, of set the romantic reading. But if you spend enough time with the work and it's done enough time with me, you find out that it is pointing to the holes, to what, in those holes that romanticism was not. So I'm interested in Schopenhauer, but I'm interested in Schopenhauer as, as a failed figure. Interesting because of it. I'm interested in Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and this, this line of sort of individualistic, if you would like to call that, as opposed to existential philosophers. Um, because at the end of the day, um, I mean, you're all sitting here. You belong to your moment, to this moment. We all belong to this moment. But you still have your own claims to yourself, to your life, to your the specificity of what happened to you and how it happened to you. So how can we get around it? How can we talk about the zeitgeist and sort of the Hegelian Marxist movement and imagine you as a cogwheel in that and only as a cogwheel? I mean, and, and so in many ways, um, I am interested in the, in the friction between the large epic movement that we all have to move through, time, history, the arc of life and death, and within that, the small, tiny revolutions of our own lives, our, our small hopes and dreams and losses and failures, which are much smaller turnings of wheels. And the, and the romantic painter will stand there and, want, and somehow feel that the universe participated in some way either by denial or by going in sync with his or her losses. But the incredible part about it is that the day that you have the biggest loss in your life, you walk outside and the sun is shining beautifully on the leaves of the tree. The world is impassive to all of that. And what, the way we try to resolve the human condition is trying to understand ourselves in relation to that world. Do you think, is that, is that to a certain extent why so much of this work is driven by a, a, an autobiographical impulse where you sort of have to draw on the stores of your own life whereas you know, when you were talking about painting as always beginning from a point of failure or for a point of futility, um, you, you know, an artist, I don't, I don't think it would be specious to say that an artist like Gerhard Richter, you know, constructs an entire corpus of, of painting, a fairly incredible painting around the idea of the, of the sort of ultimate failure of painting against photography and the image and, you know, and all this other kind of work. And so, the, you know, that, that is itself a kind of project about the resiliency of failure. But yet there's, you know, the, the autobiographical there is sort of, sort of so elliptical and with you, it's much more on the surface. Yeah, and this is true. But, but I'm glad you brought the example of Richter, who is an artist that I like, uh, who I like. Um, you know, in physics, there's all these experiments that are done on the side, along the way, um, but, and they're absolutely necessary, but the isolation of those like, small experiments does not mean that when you're con dealing with some sort of uh, major physical question, um, those things are not built in to the very nature of, of whatever you're observing. You don't have to isolate them. There's a tradition in modernism, and to an extent in postmodernism, to isolating variables that are always at play. I mean, who really, in the right mind, we said that Velasquez did not understand um, many of the things that we have isolated in modernism. I mean, thinking about what painting is and what it does. When he's cleaning his brushes on the painting, he's laying, 
his flattening space, he taking the back part of the painting and folding it into the floor. I mean, but it's not isolated. He doesn't have to necessarily decide that he's going to look at, um, say maybe Malevich will look at painting to say that many of those concerns are already there in Velazquez. Um, so although my work often starts or ends in something related to the biographical, and I'm gonna say something about that in a second, all those other questions, um, for example, the aspect of the gaze of Richter, the possibility of painting to do certain things that you want, the problematic of, of painting itself as an experience, mm. are cooked in there in a different way, except not overtly so. So, so I often say, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not the right thing to say, but I often say, you know, you know, these paintings are really not about images. They seem to be about these images. But what I spend years doing on a painting like this has little to do with the image that it ends up being here. But about the autobiographical, sorry for this turnings like this. In, um, you know, when I started painting as an apprentice, I started painting because I felt that life was more complicated than what I can understand. It seems that people moved around the world with a knowledge that I did not have. They seemed so confident as they moved around making choices. And I didn't understand how they could be so assured that this choice and not that choice was better. So I started making paintings so I can sort out those things. Um, and that's still the reason I'm making paintings. So they're not about autobiographical in a confessional sense. I don't want to tell you my story, but they are autobiographical in the sense that they're trying to understand and discover those things which I don't understand. So the confessional expressive tradition in autobiographical work, say Frida Kahlo, is about knowing something about yourself and putting it out to the world. These are all the holes of what I don't understand, what doesn't make sense to me. And out of those holes is that I construct the work. So, so that's what's sort of deceiving about the autobiographical component of them. It's not, it's not straight autobiography. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's, it makes it, it makes, there's a, there's a kind of like, there's a kind of blockade though, right? I mean, because, because it is about the lacuna in your own searching for the sort of sense of the world in these various different moments that it still revolves around a, a sort of an, in, if not, I mean, you'd have to take yourself as sort of a representative of humanity in order to say that like these are the lacuna that everybody else has. And, you know, thinking back to, and I think that when, you know, what you were describing about Richter is that, you know, for Richter it's like every body of painting is like dealing with another problem, isolates it along the way, and, you know, by the time that, you know, he kicks off, there's, you know, there's this, there's this entire sort of argument that has been made over the course of 60, 70 years, you know, no painting of which is the entire argument on its own. It's all part of this long sort of trajectory. But there's a, there's, and maybe this is just my sort of, you know, impoverishment, but there's a, there's a kind of collective argument that's being made there. And I almost, I don't have to know Richter's problems or Richter's struggles to understand that. So I feel like, and don't take this the wrong way, but there's almost a kind of, there's a kind of generosity. And I don't want to say that these paintings are sort of miserly in any way, but they're, you know, it's, maybe this is part of their authenticity, they are willing to sort of to turn their backs on the viewer, right? They're willing to turn their backs on us. And that, you know, that makes me uncomfortable in a way, right? Because it's a, it's a world that can sort of do without me as, as the, as the, as the, supposed audience to the work. And I don't, you know, I mean, you know, people in the audience will certainly have a chance to sort of have these questions for, but it's like there's an und sort of undeniable sort of feeling that there's a, you know, and there's, a, there's a closed world there. And so, you know, almost the way that this conversation is going, you know, I have to get into it first by talking about the medium, right? By talking about a certain set of structural conditions that are about painting. And then we sort of head towards 
the biographical and the autobiographical in order to maybe start to, to look at some of the imagery itself. And then I find myself sort of, you know, I like, I land on those rocks and I, I don't know, I don't know where to go. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if that failure is a good failure and then that, that it, in that it parallels the one that you're trying to contend with or whether that's, and whether it's baked into the paintings themselves or whether this is something that is a, is a function of the, of this, of that it's so, that there's something so fundamentally individual there. Yeah, that's well put. I mean, maybe, <clears throat> um, so, so let me try to explain it this way. So my father, uh, say, say I'm having a conversation with my father, we have had many, my father tells you all kinds of stories. And, and I think there are different ways to retell that, to retell that story. Um, and all of them, in some way, are ways that people do our work. One way is I can tell you the subject matter of the conversation, the nature of it. Another way is I can tell you the relationship my father and I have, you know, has been complex over the years. Um, or the other way, which is the way, is the only thing that, see, I already know my relationship, so I, why would I want to tell it? And I don't really care about the plot of the conversation that much, because plots come and go. So what's the only thing that lingers from me from that conversation with my father? What lingers is in some moment while we're talking, he will look down and I will see his eyelids looking down a certain way, and I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know why my father has settled into that particular state at that moment. It's completely mysterious to me. He seems older to me. He seems that in that glance, I see the, the guy that he was when he was young. I see him as an old man. I see, the, I see the regrets of his life. I see the possibilities of his life. I see all of that in that glance. But I can unpack it. I cannot unpack it. It's a mystery at heart. At the heart of the thing, there is something unknown. That is what I want to make work about. So when you say the biographical, it is that that I'm after. So then, it's not that it's a private world. All of you have had people glance around you in a certain way like this. All of you have, have those unknowns, those discontinuous moments of life where uh, you, you can understand what came before, what came after, but not that moment. That to me, is the area where I think art can do its biggest contribution, both in literature and, and in visual arts. But that, er that is essentially an area of, sort of in a big constinian way, that you can't speak about it. Right. So then, I am always puzzled. You see now, me saying that. Why well, I'm puzzled when people say, well, this is biographical. Well, yes and no. It is my father, but what's unknown about that glance does not really have to do with the fact that he's my father. It's something much larger in there that echoes back to me, to life itself, to aging. So, so if I work about that, then the paintings will be somewhat impenetrable, but they're impenetrable to me in the first place. I work these paintings through everything I know, so what's left at the end is what I don't know. So if a painting makes sense to me, if I understand it, if I understand the sources and the references, and I understand how I make it, I paint it over. Why would I want to make that painting? So what's left is sort of the reduction. I'm not a cook, so let me try to do an analogy. Like whatever is left at the end of that process, the, in the cold room, when you, you take in everything you knew out and you left some unknown, and that's what this is. So, People come sometimes and say, oh, this, I, I just came in five minutes, look at your painting, and it doesn't quite make sense to me. So I look at this painting four years, and it doesn't make sense to me. So. I mean, I was here for an hour and a half this afternoon, so I feel like I get a little credit. Um, that, I mean, this, this, this makes, this begins for me to build the structure that allows me to, to, to 
to, to sort of build back in that collective element, right? Because one of, the, one of the things that I get nervous about when there is that biographical aspect, or one of the things that I get nervous about when you start talking about Schopenhauer um, is that, you know, you're going to get sort of sucked into this kind of the, the world of the, you know, the world constructed for us, for me, for the subject, you know, that in, you know, ultimately becomes inscrutable to anybody else. But if I but if I hear you correctly, and this just you know this is just I need it I need the the sort of intellectual analogy to get at it you know and it almost brings it back to the sort of you know the sort of almost photographic elements that are in here is that there's a kind of there's you know the way that Roland Barthes talked about the punctum right that it talks about this thing that pricks you in the photograph that is only there for you but is obviously there in the world right and available to anybody. Um, but it's some, this sort of this unique connection that any image would have for you. You are, would it be fair to say that you are trying to construct that, you know, or trying to, trying to, trying to, you know, claw your way back to that in the work, right? It, through the process of painting, through painting as this kind of overcoming of the sort of the ultimate failure of painting or the, or the, the possible, you know, and, and, and circling around that unknown, trying to sort of stake out all the territory around it so that you can finally isolate it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's... I mean, that, but it's almost a modernist thing to be doing, right? Well, I mean... I mean, it's another kind of distillation. It's another kind of isolation. Well, I mean, in some ways, it is difficult to be a painter in 2015 or an artist in 2015 and not have to construct this from the ruins of what has happened. Right. Right? So, um, I mean, it's, it, it would be nice if I can look at painting the way, say, a Carolingian painting looked at painting because I was a religious man or something, but I can't. I can now. I mean, I... I am, for better or for worse, trapped in this moment. Um, and so, so painting now, in many ways, I know all, all this painting. Painting is sort of, and you know, not just painting, literature and so on, um, philosophy. I mean, the, the sort of breaking down a certain underlying assumptions about the thing as a given, as a thing in itself, that you can rely on the foundations of it. It, you can't rely on those foundations. So the foundations itself are part of what you question. But, but going back to, to this question, so at, at the center of, of a great work of art for me and I'm, is always a mystery. I mean, I might finish The Death of Ivan Illich by Tolstoy and, and imagine it as intellectually as a rumination of sort of Tolstoy of the end of his life. And I understand the plot and I can explain you the plot. But at the heart of it, when I put it down, what's transformative about it is some sort of shiny mystery that seems to shine light upon the world as is, but that it itself resists any translation. So if I start in, in standing in front of the Virgin of the Rocks by Da Vinci, I mean, what can we say about it? We can say a bunch of stuff. Does any of it really matter that much? At the experience of the painting, the painting holds me because at the heart of it there's something fundamental, mis fundamentally mysterious but it's not just a puzzle like a surrealist painting might be a puzzle. It is a mystery that is so bright that illuminates something fundamental about the way things are but it's just out of reach. I feel like when I look at the Virgin of the Rocks if I only stood in front of that painting long enough it will give me what it's holding back. Mm. But I wouldn't say for example that is standing in front of the Virgin of the Rocks is any more given, not to compare my work to Leonardo's work, but, but, I, would, but I wouldn't say it's any more given than, than my work is. In fact, the more I look at it, the less it gives. Okay. I'm <laughs> we, can, we, can, we, can, we can, you know, drag Leonardo into this and say that he's an ungenerous <laughs> painter as well, and, you know, and then we can construct an entire sort of history of, of the lack of generosity in painting, and you know, maybe we'd be somewhere. Um, let, me, let me throw somebody else into that ring then, too. Um, this, is the, this is the first exhibition that I, of your work where the first artist that I thought of was Anselm Kiefer. And 
and particularly with this work. Um, and I had, you know, and I'd seen the show. I mean, I'd seen I've seen your work now over a decade, um, and you know, it never it never occurred to me when I saw the the show in Miami with some of these epic sweeping paint. I mean, this you know it was as far from from Kiefer as I could imagine. But this work all of a sudden, you know, popped into my head, and I know you're thinking about it too. What, you know, in your mind, I'm sort of I'm curious to sort of think about you know what what role sort of Kiefer in that and that sort of body of, of, of work and that and 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 that and the sort of commitment that's demonstrated there or or you know s kinds of commitments that are demonstrated there how that how you see yourself in relationship to 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 Kiefer as an example of the, of that kind of I don't I, again you know yeah. lack of <clears throat> generosity let's say another <laughs> well that that's a really I'm so I'm very grateful for this question because it circles around me like some sort of uh, funk. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the, the reason why this painting, among other things, points is to sort of the use of linear perspective, which none of these paintings have. This, the rest of the paintings here use sectional perspective. If you want to think about it, sort of a, as a sort of a Chinese painting might, but this using linear perspective, which is a device that Kiefer exploits, among other things, and also the fact that I use writing. But let me let me take that and talk more about it. So in many ways, uh, Ansel Kiefer and I mined a very similar territory, sort of this Heideggerian territory that is sort of the intersection of materials, world, self, and so on. Um, but but there's, there's significant differences. I mean, so the intersection of literature and art and this sort of Heideggerian unifying factor make already for a lot of similarities among us. And the work of Ansel Kiefer of the 1970s, in my opinion, is, is some of the best work that was done in the last 50 years. The work after 1982 or 84 then is something else, pastiche of itself, in my opinion. Um, and, and there's an irony there, and a, a desire to create certain historical artifacts that point back in a circular way to themselves as artifacts. Let me try to say that in a better way. So, so the use of language of Kiefer, which is taken from, typically from other writers like Paul Salan and so on, mm -hmm. that use of writing is, is, is often lifted right from the poet, placed in the work, and when you see 50 works with the same sort of concerns, to me, my interpretation of it, I find it sort of as an imprimatur of a certain gravitas that is not in the work to begin with, that maybe was there in the work when it was more problematic and less cooked. But what's happening now, in, when I see it, is a sense of Kiefer knowing Kiefer too well. Um, and, 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 and you know, one of the things that, that I, when I was a graduate student, I read this quote for Jasper Johns, the saying that when he was younger, he was afraid that any of his work would look like anybody else. And then, of course, when he got older, partly because he could afford it, he didn't care. Um, so for me, it still bothers me, of course, um, partly because when I was here at the opening, some critic came over and told me that my handwriting, the actual handwriting, remind him of Kiefer, so handwriting. And, and of course, hearing that at, the, at your opening, is. Is, <laughs> is, is interesting. Um, so, so it exists there, and it, but there, the differences are at the heart of what the work is. Um, even though superficially, when you figure, put figures on landscapes in this particular mixture of epic and domestic friction, you're going to end up with similar things. Um, but I will... I would say that um, we have some people in common that, um, that have written about both of the works, and I, I would say that at this moment in time, um, the, at this moment in time, the difference between us is the concern for the authenticity of the work itself, among other things. Um, 
that's a kind of a tall thing to throw out in a room. That's why I'm kind of hesitating. Um, but well, but that's let, let me help you out because you know I had been thinking about this. I had gone back and I'd looked at some you know some of the some people who had written work uh, written about Kiefer's work and. Um, actually, one of the writers who writes for me at Art Review had finished up a, a piece, um, you know, a, f a few years ago. And what? And, and this is the, this was the last. This is the last sentence of this review of, of, a, of a show of Kiefer's, and you'll you'll know exactly why I'm I'm saying this now. And he says, "Quote: What undergirds Kiefer's work is not a sense of humility in search of the ineffable, or an ethical and spiritual constancy, but its opposite." a conviction in the transcendent, ineffable power of the artist's own work. Right. And I take, you know, and I was thinking about that, I mean, this is, I'm not here to sort of drag Kiefer through the mud, right? I mean, I think that there's, you know, Kiefer's a very, very important, very interesting artist. But, but you know, for me, that sort of encapsulated in, in, the, in, in what this writer was getting, not from Kiefer, but exactly what one gets, what I get from your work, which is this sense this, again, I'll read this. The sense of humility in search of the ineffable or an ethical and spiritual constancy, right? And I don't, I don't, I don't think that I could have found a, a, a sort of better constellation of that. And, and, and elsewhere, and this will sort of be the, my last um, sort of prompt, and then, and then I'd like to open it up to, to, to you and the audience. So if you have questions or things you want to ask, please prepare them and we'll get the, the, uh, the, the microphones ready. Um, but you've, elsewhere you've spoken about painting in your practice as a kind of, as a kind of ethical commitment, right? As a kind of <coughs> commitment to this practice. And I was hoping that you could, you could say a little bit more about what that ethical commitment sort of means to you and how it operates because when I, you know, there, there's another, and I keep, you know, I don't have a thing for, for you know, the, for sort of Germanic, German-speaking people, but you know, the, Thomas Hirschhorn is a very interesting artist with a sort of very sort of a clear sense of a sort of ethical commitment to artistic practice. Um, and it was somebody else who I'd been thinking about after I left this show today with, with regards to the same appreciation for a uh, literary and philosophical legacy that is not a, a, a resource for the work, but is simply another, you know, in, uh, the sort of environment, another another set of texts and things that are important for thinking through what Hirschhorn's work means to him. So, um, if you could speak a little bit about what that, what you think about when you're thinking about the ethical commitment that is this practice. You know, over the years, I used to write a lot about this and talk a lot about this over the years, and and I have slowly you not. Know, been taking these words out of my, of what I say, partly because speaking of one's ethics is kind of like speaking of one's virtue. It's like embarrassing um, of a thing. So, and it's better to, it's better to be something one shows. Better just to than, compare yourself to Leonardo and be done with it. <laughs> only, only by the negativity of it. Um, so, so, I mean, I think, I, as I mentioned before, I, I started as a painter to try to make sense of the choices one makes in life. How do you make a distinction between two things that seem to be very close to each other? How do you, how do you make the decision to go this path and not the other? And some people go to religion for that. Some other people go to, to psychologists for that. And I go to art for that. And art is, to me, the searching of that and trying to make those distinctions. So when people speak about the, the ethics in their practice, they often mean the very act of the practice, how they carry it through, how they behave in their studio, and all of that. And all of those things are fundamental and important to me. But ethics for me, and the reason I'm interested in ethics and is, is because it's in the work itself, it's in the choice, not ethics in the content of what you see, not in this particular image, but in the way the image was dealt with and acknowledged, and in the way that a certain confession of, of the lack of means is acknowledged as an ethical choice. Um, and and the very crude materials that I use, or, or the choice of seed, or of the particular stance on those boys' fists, 
or the particular bird up there, those were not decisions that I make from an aesthetic point of view. They were not like, let me see what bird would look better with it. Um, but rather something else at play, something that allows me to make a distinction between, between aspects of the world that are otherwise opaque and difficult to see. So, um, so that's why I have a tendency myself to read this work through it rather than by it. Not through it that you look in the translation of these paintings for what it might mean, as people often ask me, what does, what does the bird mean or what does the tree on fire mean? But look through it as you look at the whole assembly and you say, what is the worldview? What is the stance here? And the fact that you ask, that you will ask that question is, is the question I'm asking myself. From which stance was this work made? What is the worldview that this world shows, work shows? And how is that worldview representative of an ethical position to myself and the world? So I think this is a good time to open it up to the audience with some questions. Presumably there are, yep, I see some hands, good. to find something um, unknowable or, um, I forget the word that you used. Um, do you ever get to it right off the bat and can you trust that? Do you feel, do you have trouble trusting that? Well, you know, I, I arrive at these paintings after a lot of searching and I find in them a certain recognition, a certain resonance that tells me this is how it had to be and not any other way. I mean, I arrive at these paintings through, through a lot of movements around. So, but the fact that there is a recognition there of, of something like truth in, in them for me does not mean that, that what they point to is, is clearer. It's just that they're pointed to something and it's the pointer that is very clear. It said this is where it is. But what's at the end of that pointer is, is always out of reach, which is the reason why I make the next body of work and the next body of work. So I construct the work um, from the holes of the previous body of work. So the tendency of progress, of the way we think of developing our own authority is by building in what you did before and did do more of it and do it better and construct in that way, um, you know, a, a career or a discovery. For me, I'm interested in building on the holes of what came before. So I'm always working from a deficit or from a hole. So, so it's not really a buildup of authority. So, so in this work, whatever remains out of reach will fuel the next body of work and the one after that. Well, as I have the privilege of staring straight at the, the burning tree, for me, it so resonates with the burning bush and how God exposed himself to Moses on Sinai. So I think to myself, it's interesting, it's right to the left of this fence, which is also so reminiscent of Auschwitz and the concentration camps and Salon's Todesfuge. And you see, with Anselm Kiefer's work too, the, just the bareness of the fence, yet here there's greenery and there's light and there's fire. And so for me it begs the question, which I think the exhibit begs, is where is the ethics, where is the morality in a world that has extreme depravity yet extreme humanity? And to me it's encompassed, where is God? Where the burning bush he exposed himself, where is he today, where is he in the midst of these tragedies? Not only what happened, God forbid, in Auschwitz, but what happens today, you know, constantly, the genocides that continue to go on. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a good, I'm glad you brought that up because it allows me to, to sort of talk about something briefly. Um, I mean, the way, uh, Ansel Kiefer would construct his images or Kiki Smiths or many of these people is to go back and mine these myths or these histories 
um, and use them as building blocks of a particular experience. But the reason why the burning bush is in the Bible is because it itself is a hunting image before it was in the Bible. But these archetypes have a reason for being that, that goes to something very fundamental about the escape of these branches that you see up there trying to escape that fire. But remember, this is not a fire. This is just a painting of a fire. And that is not a small distinction. Um, so, so the content of it in my work is not, is, not, is not what the ethics lay that say, you know, in Death View but that, you, that you mentioned by Paul Salan, sort of the particular sense. I mean, if I was going to speak of where will I find, for example, the ethics on Paul Salan, I would think the ethics of Ponce Land, the very structure of those poems, in the very holes between the words, in the silence that is in those poems, more than, than in the telling of you know, the black milk from, from, the, from the Germans as an image, although as an image is as hunting as it come, but, but really is what, how is it that you construct a poem like this, sort of this, this I mean, the, the whole notion, that, that famous um, idea that how could you write a poem after Auschwitz? Well, it's not that you can write a poem. It's that many poems now cannot be written, but you can still write a poem like Paul Salan did. It just it speaks of a certain ethical stance that you have to take towards poetry after that event, after those things, after that tragedy. After that tragedy, some poems are just ridiculous. But not all poems are ridiculous. And remember, it wasn't that you can't write poetry, it's that to write poetry after Auschwitz was barbaric. Right. And so to do it, you have to court that barbarism in order to you know, rejuvenate and to, to find a way back in, right? Which, is, which, is, you know, which, which, which would be the argument that Kiefer would make, right? Uh, but you know, but, but before, Auschwitz, you know, you have Miguel Hernandez writing in the Spanish Civil War of the atrocities of the mass graves of Spanish people in front of the Republican army, Lorca, Miguel Hernandez himself. I mean, and he's still, I mean, if you don't know this poetry, um, it might be a good, good discovery, but um, I mean, I mean, I, it's, it, was, it was the ultimate courageous act to sit down and write a poem when you're, when you're in jail and your son is dying as he was Miguel Hernandez's son because they have nothing to eat. I mean, what else would you do? And the challenge for Miguel Hernandez is not, why don't you come up with some content that speaks of the right ethics of having your son dying, but rather, what kind of poet would you be and what kind of words would you choose that will make the horror of that somehow not look on, uh, to your, uh, your poem as some sort of silly little gesture. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is a tall order, mm -hmm. but possible, I guess. Right here in front. Thank you. That was really a beautiful um, reading of the painting and it's what struck me when I saw it too and I noticed that in the postcard you have a hummingbird you know you have a bird rather in it and then it was taken out and um, a couple of my artist friends and I were like oh look you took out the bird <laughs> and I wanted to know what was that process for you what was that decision process for you and you know did it have any kind of extra symbology to you as you were doing it and then what was taking it out like? Um, you know, a lot of these paintings sacrificed a lot of things that I liked along the way. This painting had a boy right here, didn't have a tree, then it had a, had a bird. And the bird, at the end of the day, the bird had, oak, had brought the painting to where it was. Um, it was, that bird had, in the initial version of it, that bird was about to eat a monarch butterfly. And the bird that, people saw as a sort of a beautiful bird was actually a very aggressive bird 
that the boy was trying to push away. So he brought this painting to where it was. But at the end, at the very end, the bird was there because the bird, the bird was, was a holdout from, from the past of what the painting had been. And part of giving it up and losing the bird is precisely because I like the bird. And because I liked the bird, I knew it had to go. Um, so, but what I did, if you look at this painting carefully, you will realize that I very purposely smear the area where the bird was so you know that there's a patch here. So, so paintings, the way they paint, what's underneath the paintings reveals themselves is by exercising a pressure in what the paintings are now to pressure to me as a painter of what I gave up. So even though you may not see a lot of the history of the painting, hopefully it is felt somehow in the way things were treated. I mean, in the same way most of you, or all of you, are today a result of what came before, even though I don't know what that was. But, but if I look at you long enough, I probably can sense part of that history, but, but it's not so obvious. Um, and I think I think the past have altered these paintings. Um, Maybe from this side of the audience, if there's one. We've got another up here in the front. <clears throat> yeah, raise your hand high. Um, you said that um, you liked the bird and therefore it had to go. What do you feel um, the moment you stop working on a painting when it's done? Like, what is your sentiment then? So I know, I know that a painting is finished when it has an autonomy away from me, when somehow it becomes, when it's no longer my thing. Um, there's a very beautiful writing that Ortega Gasset has, and, and they called it the humanization of art. The idea that the artist passed through the human, and only when it sheds a human, is that the possibility of, of art is, opens up. So for me, these paintings, when I no longer feel like I own them, I own the choices in them, then I know the painting is finished. So for that reason, when I'm talking about my paintings, I'm talking about somebody else's paintings, I might say something looks good or bad, and only when people look at me in a funny way, I realize, oh, I'm talking about my own painting. Um, so, but, but I'm trying to read the paintings of any affectations. You know, I am interested in paintings that are not a collection of affectations, what the things I like. I like this and I like that. I try to make my studio itself into something other than a collection of affectations. So what I'm looking for a painting is a painting to teach me how to live life better. So if I'm trying to create some sort of teacher, to, to, to say it in the simplest way, I, why would I want it to model it after all my affectations? Those are usually my hang-ups, what I'm stuck with, what I like, my little weird predilections, my, my bizarre little likings. Um, so what I want is something that somehow has the possibility of being better than me or um, truer than me. So, so when the painting goes to that and I recognize in it a distance from me, then I say, okay, this painting is now finished. And that's why very often it's not the thing I like the most in the painting. I think that might be a great place to close out, close out this painting. I think a round of applause for Enrique and for the show. It's really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.